This afternoon, the House Armed Services Committee meets to receive testimony from commanders of the United States Central Command and the United States Special Operations Command on the posture of their respective commands. It's an understatement, perhaps, to say recent events give this hearing an even greater urgency. Developments in the past six months, and especially in the past six weeks, present new opportunities and new uncertainties for our nation's security and the environment in which CENTCOM and SOCOM operate. Extremist Islamist groups and their use of terrorism directly threatens the physical security of American citizens at home and abroad. Consequently, in Afghanistan, 100,000 U.S. servicemen and women are fighting to disrupt, dismantle, and eventually defeat al-Qaeda in the country from which it planned and conducted the 9-11 attacks. In the past year, our forces have reduced Taliban influence and arrested the momentum of al-Qaeda's allies, particularly in the Helmand and Kandahar provinces expanded special operations forces targeting of Taliban leadership and expanded local security measures at the village and district level have been an integral part of this momentum shift. Significant progress has also been made by the NATO training mission in the development of the Afghan National Security Forces. Yet it remains to be determined whether these gains will be lasting. Nevertheless, the President remains committed to redeploying troops in just four months. Similarly, uncertainty surrounds the recent uprising in the Middle East. While inspirational and likely to undermine extremism's appeal over the long term, they also potentially undermine several pillars of our strategic posture in the region in the near term. For example, I read with concern comments from opposition leaders in Egypt that the Camp David Accords are finished. Instability may undermine efforts to build our partners' counterterrorism capacity a particularly troubling scenario in Yemen, where al-Qaeda on the Arabian Peninsula continues to present the most significant risk to the U.S. homeland, according to the administration. Against the backdrop, backdrop of these dramatic events, Iran continues research on key components for a nuclear weapon, the development of which alter the regional balance of power and allow Tehran to increase its long-standing support of terrorist proxies without fear of military retaliation. Also, we're scheduled to withdraw 50,000 U.S. forces from Iraq, despite questions regarding that country's ability to defend itself from both internal and external threats. The blistering pace of current events and the uncertainty they've created raise difficult and important questions for the future of our national security. To address these issues, we're fortunate to be joined today by two officers with long and distinguished careers of service to their nation. General James Mattis, Commander, U.S. Central Command, and Admiral Eric T. Olson, Commander, U.S. Special Operations Command. Gentlemen, I thank you for appearing here today and for your many years of service, devotion to your country. I take great comfort in knowing that warriors such as yourself are, are at the helm of leadership over so many great people uh, that are laying their lives on the line every day on behalf of freedom around the world. Thank you for your service. Uh, Rank Member Smith. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. With votes coming up uh, so quickly, I will be, be very brief. I associate myself with the Chairman's remarks. I think he greatly sum he perfectly summed up the challenges uh, the two of you face. Um, I do want to uh, give special recognition to Admiral Olson, um, since he's, he's from Tacoma. I always have to mention that. Graduate of Stadium High School. Not in my district, but it is the high school that my children would go to, so very close by. And I also you know, really enjoyed working with you during my time as chair of what was then the Terrorism Subcommittee, which had jurisdiction over SOCOM. have the highest admiration for the job you do and the job the people you command do as well, and I appreciate that. And General Mattis, um, you have uh, the, the greatest responsibility of the, the commanders right now now uh, in a very, very complicated part of the world. And you're meeting those challenges very well and serving us well. I look forward to hearing your testimony and hearing the questions of members about how we can help you uh, to meet the challenges that both of you face. And with that, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, Admiral Olson, this, I guess, is your last appearance before this committee. Is that correct? Last scheduled? It is the last scheduled appearance, yes, sir. Well, maybe we'll be fortunate it won't be your last. Uh, would you please uh, begin, and then we'll hear from uh, General Mattis. 
Yes, sir. Thank you. Good morning, Chairman McKeon and Representative Smith and other distinguished members of the committee. I do thank you for this opportunity to appear before you to present the current posture of the United States Special Operations Command. We at the Special Operations Command do recognize that we were created by the Congress and our ability to meet our nation's high expectations is due in large part to this committee's continued strong support. And I'm especially pleased to share this hearing with my friend and teammate, General Jim Mattis. General Mattis's headquarters and mine are coincident coincidentally located on the same base in Tampa, and we and our staffs work together quite closely. So with your permission, I'll submit my written posture statement for the record and open with some brief remarks. As Secretary Gates said in his speech at West Point last weekend, and as you noted, uh, Mr. Chairman, we do not know with certainty what the future of warfare will hold, the range of security challenges we face beyond Iraq and Afghanistan, decentralization of al-Qaeda's network, revolutionary activity in the Middle East, destabilizing elements in Latin America, Africa, and Southeast Asia, increased intertwining of violent extremism and criminality, and persistence of piracy tell us that it will be complex unpredictable and unstructured. United States Special Operations Forces are universally recognized as key to our nation's ability to address all of these challenges and others. In many ways, U.S. SOCOM is a microcosm of the Department of Defense with ground, air, and maritime components, a global presence and authorities and responsibilities that mirror the military departments, military services, and defense agencies. We take pride in the diversity of our people and our mission. As the commander, I am responsible and accountable for the readiness of all Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marine Corps Special Operations Forces. With a dedicated budget and through my component commanders, I select, organize, train, equip, and deploy these forces to serve all of our geographic combatant commanders. With 85 percent of our deployed forces currently in the Central Command area of operations, my colleague to my left is by far the largest customer of our product. We include many forces of legend, Green Berets, SEALs, Rangers, Air Force Air Commandos, Army Night Stalker Aviators, Combat Controllers, Pararescue Jumpers, Combatant Craft Crewmen, today's version of Marine Raiders, and others. The active duty practitioners of civil military operations and military information support operations are also in our ranks. These are special operations careerists. They are backed by a talented and dedicated assortment of administrative, intelligence, communications, engineering, logistics, and other specialists who serve in special operations units on a less permanent basis. And our various headquarters also include over 300 representatives from at least 15 other agencies within and beyond the Department of Defense. I'm convinced that the forces we provide to the geographic combatant commanders are the most culturally attuned partners, most lethal hunter-killers, and most responsive, agile, innovative, and efficiently effective advisors, trainers, problem solvers, and warriors that any nation has to offer. In fact, we have become the model for many of our partners. Our value comes from both our high level of skills and our non-traditional methods of applying them, which is to say that our principal asset is the quality of our people. Whether they are conducting a precision raid, organizing a village police force, arranging for a new school or clinic, or partnering with counterpart forces. They do so in a manner that has impressive effects. In Afghanistan and Iraq especially, it is undeniable that they have impact far above their relatively small numbers. And they are in dozens of other countries every day, contributing to regional stability by advising and training with counterpart forces. The balance of direct and indirect operations must be carefully managed. But because Special Operations Forces live in both of those worlds, we become the, for, the force of first choice for many missions. As Admiral Mullen said in his testimony yesterday, Special Operations Forces are first in and last out. I am proud of these forces, as we all should be, but I also acknowledge that there are challenges. Key among them is how to meet the increasing global requirement for their capabilities. The demand is outpacing the supply, but we can't grow them more than a very few percent per year. Since 911, our total manpower has roughly doubled, our budget has roughly tripled, and our overseas deployments have quadrupled. And as I have said recently, this great force is beginning to fray around the edges. The fabric is strong, the weave is tight, 
It's not unraveling, but it's showing signs of wear. For some elements of our force, time at home has become the abnormal condition to which the family must adjust. Partial solutions include finding a process that will habitually and predictably assign units from the services to train and deploy with Special Operations Forces, ensuring our needs for local training ranges are fully met, providing the buildings and facilities that our force needs and deserves, investing more heavily in capabilities that will relieve Special Operations Forces from duties that do not require our unique skills, expanding the services inventory of specific assets that are so, that are so essential to today's complex and irregular warfare, and recognizing and incentivizing many non-traditional skills, such as language and micro-regional expertise, as essential military requirements. We must ensure that our forces have the specialized equipment and advanced training they need to survive and succeed in the complex, ambiguous, and often violent environments in which we ask them to serve, which requires professionalizing the acquisition workforce and streamlining procurement processes. Underlying all of this is the need to look after our people and their families. We must rehabilitate and return to duty those of our wounded who can, care for those of our wounded who can't, along with their families and caregivers, and provide enduring support to the families of those who have died in action. I ask for your action to approve a defense budget for fiscal year 2011 and for your support for the fiscal year 2012 budget proposal. I also ask that you carefully watch the special operations budget particularly as forces eventually begin to draw down from major operations, because our special operations forces will most likely be reallocated at the same levels to areas with pent-up demand for our unique capabilities, a point reinforced in Secretary Gates' testimony just yesterday. Thank you again for this opportunity to appear before you. You have reason to take great pride in what the men and women of special operations forces are accomplishing around the world today and every day. I remain humbled by my opportunity to command this formidable force and provide it to answer our nation's most daunting security needs. And as I appear before you in this capacity for the fourth and most likely the last time, I am thankful for the profound honor of serving my country in this way. I stand ready for your questions. Thank you, Admiral. General Mattis, I think this is your first time in this capacity. In this capacity, correct. yes, Chairman, it is. <laughs> Thank you. The time is yours. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, Congressman Smith, distinguished members of the committee. I appreciate the opportunity to discuss the posture and priorities of U.S. Central Command, testifying alongside a friend and shipmate of many years, Admiral Eric Olson, Commander of U.S. Special Operations Command. I have submitted a written statement and request it be accepted into the record. <clears throat> Thank you for supporting our troops and their families who carry the brunt of the physical and emotional burden in this tenth year of war. Our forces today are among the most dedicated and skilled professionals I have served alongside in my 39 years in uniform, and they constitute a national treasure. I also recognize the commitment and sacrifices of our international partners who operate with us from the waters off Somalia to the mountains of Afghanistan where the largest warfighting coalition in recent history is engaged with troops from 49 nations united in the fight against our common enemy. The strategic landscape of the broader Middle East has been altered by recent events in Tunisia, Egypt, Libya, and elsewhere. We see pressure on government institutions from the aspirations of people seeking improved economic and social conditions. Young people born in the information age are exchanging ideas in real time. While the long-term impact of this unrest is unknown, it presents as many opportunities as it does challenges. The changes that we are seeing will manifest differently in each country. People are seeking their rights and, for the most part, doing so peacefully and bravely. It's too early to say how it will all turn out. It is important that we work today with the people and the governments throughout the region. We don't want to see this change slide into a new form of authoritarianism. So while there is both opportunity and danger, it requires unrelenting engagement by our nation. The central challenge for us, I believe, is how to make common cause with our friends throughout the region. 
There is one clear lesson we can draw from the dramatic changes underway. Now more than ever, we must remain relentlessly engaged with our military partners across the region. While we know each country is different, we remain committed to strengthening our military bonds and advancing our mutual interests in peace and opportunity for all. Notably, in Egypt, we have clearly seen the benefit of mature military-to-military -military relationships. The Egyptian Armed Forces continue to demonstrate exceptional discipline and restraint under trying circumstances, serving honorably. As Admiral Mullen recently noted, our assistance has helped the Egyptian military become the professional force that it is today. Just as our military in, learn, in turn has learned a great deal from our Egyptian counterparts who have contributed a stabilizing influence in this time of transition. Of course, we cannot achieve our broader objectives in the region through military means alone. Our efforts require coordination and a spirit of collaboration between highly integrated civilian military teams. Our civilian colleagues need your full support, even in this difficult fiscal environment, to undertake their essential role in today's complex environment. Robust resourcing for the State Department's mission is one of the best investments for reducing the need for military forces to be employed. Together, our military leaders and diplomats not only represent a symbol of America's enduring commitment to this region, but they also build trust through partnerships that have an important stabilizing effect when trouble looms. CENTCOM's main effort is in Afghanistan, where with, along with our Afghan and coalition partners, we are making undeniable security progress, though some of our gains remain fragile and reversible. Al-Qaeda in the border region between Afghanistan and Pakistan is under the most pressure they have experienced since 2001. Over the past year, our enemies have lost leaders, they've lost battle space, maneuver room, and the initiative and the enemy's strategy has been undercut by the clear commitment of the international community and the Afghan government to begin this summer a process of fully transitioning responsibility to Afghanistan lead by 2014. I support the President's ongoing analysis of further growth for the Afghan National Security Forces. Their quantifiable and qualifiable growth in capability has been one of our greatest successes over this last year. With this improving quality and combat performance by the Afghan security forces, we are seeing the enemy's worst nightmare coming of age. The transition process will start with a limited, conditions-based withdrawal this year. Our overall campaign is on track in Afghanistan. Our successes, as General Petraeus has stated, entailed hard fighting and tough losses. And there will be tough fighting ahead as the enemy tries this spring to regain the initiative. Finally, we must also redouble our efforts in order to address the challenges in the areas of governance and development. Turning now to Pakistan, we are strengthening and deepening our security relationship with Islamabad, even as we work to overcome years of mistrust and misunderstanding on both sides. The Pakistanis have shifted a quarter of their army 140,000 troops to the western border, and we are now conducting hammer and anvil operations in close coordination with them on opposite sides of the border. Pakistan's military has conducted significant counter counterinsurgency ops in the past decade, and having suffered 2,757 troops killed and 8,549 wounded, while also responding to urgent humanitarian needs following devastating floods in 2010. In Iraq, we are helping a new, more stable country emerge in a turbulent region. Our commitment there is transitioning from a military to a civilian-led effort. I will note that the transition underway in Iraq has been enabled in large part thanks to the vital commitment and support of Congress for our troops on the ground, and I want to personally offer my thanks to you. As we transition to civilian lead in Iraq, it is essential that the State Department be sufficiently resourced to solidify relationships between the U.S. and Iraq. At CENTCOM, we need congressional authorities that enable us to continue advising, training, and equipping our Iraqi partners through the new Office of Security Cooperation in Iraq. Looking ahead, we will redeploy our military forces from Iraq this year unless asked to stay by the Iraqi government 
and the U.S. government concurs. I anticipate al-Qaeda in Iraq and Iranian-sponsored proxies will attempt to execute sensational attacks against us in the coming months. Next, Iran. The greatest threat to long-term regional stability is a defiant Iran in its current state. We are countering the malign activities of the regime while bolstering relationships with our partners. Iran continues to rebuff international efforts for engagement, continues to coerce its own population, and continues to pursue activities disruptive to regional peace and stability, including supplying arms to militant proxies in Iraq and Afghanistan and supporting Hezbollah in Lebanon. But for the vibrant people of Iran, the regime is no giant. The regime's actions have thrown the economy into disarray, destroyed rapport with the bulk of the world, and spread hate and discontent across the region, steadily eroding any international support the regime could once muster. Despite the shrinking stature of the regime, I have no reason for optimism about Iran's pursuit of a nuclear weapons capability of its growing ballistic missile arsenal and present destabilizing course. Across the region, we are disrupting al-Qaeda and other violent extremist organizations. We are actively focused on the threat of extremism in Yemen, especially al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, the group that has twice attempted to attack our homeland in recent years. With our international partners, our special operations forces are putting our most violent enemies and related networks under increasingly intense pressure. At the same time, the populist-inspired changes that are taking place across the region undercut the message of al-Qaeda and other extremist groups, highlighting the bankrupt philosophies of terrorists who use violence and contribute nothing but mayhem to the innocent. In direct repudiation to violent extremists, young folks today have achieved more change in 10 weeks than 10 years of al-Qaeda's murderous campaigns. So that's a snapshot of our major ongoing operations. We are focused on a number of other important mission areas as well to include countering piracy. There can be no more stark reminder about the need for more proactive, diplomatic, legal, and military efforts against pirates than the brutal murder of four Americans by pirates last week. This is a defining moment for the people in this region, and by extension, a critical moment for CENTCOM to remain engaged with our partners and to clear away obstacles to peace and prosperity. On that note, while Israel and the Palestinian territories are not in my assigned theater, lack of progress toward a comprehensive Middle East peace affects U.S. and CENTCOM security interests in the region. I believe the only reliable path to lasting peace in this region is a viable two-state solution between Israel and Palestine. The issue is one of many that is exploited by our adversaries in the region, and it is used as a recruiting tool for extremist groups. The lack of progress also creates friction with regional partners and creates political challenges for advancing our interests by marginalizing moderate voices in the region. By contrast, substantial progress on the peace process would improve CENTCOM's opportunities to work with our regional partners and support multilateral security efforts. We know that you face tough decisions in this constrained fiscal environment, ladies and gentlemen. In all of our activities at CENTCOM, we honor the obligation to be the best stewards possible of our nation's monetary resources. CENTCOM has established stringent control mechanisms to execute our fiscal authorities and to apply increasingly effective oversight of all our programs. Finally, Mr. Chairman, Congressmen and Congresswomen, we must never forget the families of those who gave their last full measure in defense of liberty. Thank you once again for your support of our men and women serving in the Central Command region. I'm prepared to answer your questions. Thank you very much. Without objection, both of your statements will be entered in the record. Uh, the, the vote schedule has changed. It's now two votes, so we, we will have to recess. But I, I will hold my questions to later, and I'll turn now to Ranking Member Smith. And um, we will, after his questions, we will recess for 10 to 15 minutes as soon as we can get back. Mr. Smith. I will en endeavor to do this quickly in light of that. And I just have uh, four questions, and a couple of them, one of the things I'm doing with uh, Congresswoman Giffords being out, I'm working with her staff to ask questions that she has as well. So 
Uh, two of these are hers and two of these are mine, but the first one that I do want you to get to, Admiral Olson, as quickly as possible, you have su significant MILCON challenges. We've grown your force uh, a lot in the last five or six years. We have not grown the facilities to accommodate it. Could you say just a couple of quick words about your needs in the MILCON area? Yes, sir. We do have significant needs. There were disconnects between the growth of the force and growth in MILCON. And uh, to, to, ex to add to that, uh, we inherited buildings when Special Operations Command was created without inherited a budget to recapitalize them. So we are in a period, a state over the next 10 to 15 years of having to swallow this large chunk of MILCON recapitalization. Yeah, and I just want the, the committee to be aware of that, and as we look at our budget uh, efforts here, we should try to help out in any way we can. Uh, General Mattis, I have two questions. One of them uh, for me, one of them from Congresswoman Giffords. She has an interest in the um, non, well, sorry, um, her interest is in the energy area, and uh, you have considerable fuel requirements. You have been quoted as saying that you need to be unleashed from the tether of fuel uh, and the challenges that that presents. Uh, efforts at generating alternatives and efficiencies can make a huge difference in you being able to prosecute the fights you need to prosecute. Can you tell us a little bit about your efforts in CENTCOM to deal with the challenges you have in the fuel area? And then an area that I'm particularly interested in is something that I read an article about just recently, and that is uh, efforts to counter um, Al-Qaeda's messaging over the Internet. Um, CENTCOM seem to have gotten out front on that. I think this is critical. This is where they're spreading their ideology, certainly in your region, but throughout the world. This is how they're recruiting the people. They are doing it in an incredibly sophisticated way that we are woefully behind on. Um, you guys seem to be stepping up and trying to address that. So could you talk a little bit about uh, the fuel and about the Internet uh, ideological battle? Yes, sir, I will. On the fuel, uh, it's a significant Achilles heel for us. When you have to haul the amounts of fuel that we have to haul around the battlefield for the generators and for the vehicles. We are working with DARPA. We are working with a number of civilian organizations to try and find solutions. There are efforts underway to make uh, more expeditionary bases, which would actually generate some of their own uh, energy requirements using, for example, uh, solar power. In many of these places, there's a lot of sunshine. If we can get expeditionary capability to capture that and then uh, basically recharge our, our batteries, I mean, it, it's an amazingly complex effort to maintain the fuel lines. And it also uh, gives the enemy an ability to choose the time and place of attacking us. We're engaged with science and technology. We're engaged with DARPA. And we're looking at a very pragmatic ways of doing this. We're also looking and what we can do to actually change how we distribute fuel to reduce the enemy's opportunities to come after us. And I could meet privately with you on, on some of those matters that I'd prefer not to speak about in open session. Not sure on the uh, Internet effort, uh, the point I would make is that the enemy is using the Internet exactly along the lines that you defined. Uh, they use it for, uh, it, it for recruiting is the one that comes immediately to mind. We can directly track some of this. Uh, in broad terms, we challenge their propaganda, uh, we disrupt the recruiting, we show that it's, that it's silly to go along this line, that it just doesn't make sense. We bring out the moderate voices, we amplify those, and in more detail, we detect and we flag uh, if there is adversary, hostile, corrosive content in some open source web forum. We engage with the web administrators to show that this violates website provider policies. Uh, and probably uh, more telling about uh, how we engage here, we have a digital engagement team at CENTCOM. It's fully attributable, but we engage with the people in the region who come up on the web and start exchanging ideas, and we give factual and accurate information to counter enemy propaganda and lies through using the web and the blog sites. We uh, do this in Arabic, Farsi, Urdu, and Pashto. Yeah. But we are engaged in the Internet fight. And this is something that I think DOD-wide and intelligence community-wide we have to be engaged in, because the way al-Qaeda has changed since 9-11, um, certainly the AQ senior leadership is still a threat, but the larger threat is the way they generate self-starters. Um, sort of homegrown uh, terrorists who go on the Internet, get inspired by this stuff, and it has 
increased to a level that I think would shock a lot of people, and we need to be much more aggressive about that. Uh, the last question I have is on a direct, uh, on non-lethal uh, means of um, uh, subduing the enemy. I'll take that one for the record. It's something Congresswoman Gifford uh, is interested in as well. If you could just update us a little bit, Admiral, um, you know, send something to us on the record about what you've been doing with non-lethal non uses of force. Um, there's been considerable advancement there. And I do just want to conclude by ma making a special thank you to the uh, Special Operations Command uh, and the Navy SEAL team in particular um, that shortly after the incident in Tucson went out on a mission um, in uh, Congresswoman Gifford's honor. Um, they actually uh, flew a flag for that mission and then made sure that it got to her uh, where she is rehabilitating. Uh, that means a great deal to her and to all of us. Um, your dedication and support for her and for this committee um, is very much appreciated, and certainly the work you do for our country uh, is very much appreciated as well. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. We will adjourn now for 10 to 15 minutes in time to, to uh, vote and get back. Uh, Mr. Bartlett will be the first question when we get back. Thank you. Uh, um, Mr. Bartlett. Thank you very much. General, on uh, page uh, 9 of your written testimony, you say that China pursues its many energy-related interests throughout the region. I have a couple of slides that may help put that in context. If we can have the first one, let's see if it shows up on the screen. Uh, three things of significance in this first slide while it's coming up. First of all, there's now general recognition, the large blue below, that we have reached the world's ma maximum production of oil, that from now on it's simply going down. This is from the oil fields we're now pumping oil from. By 2030, it's, they say that we'll be getting considerably less than half the oil from those fields that we're getting now. There are two wedges there, the blue wedge and the red wedge, that say we're going to be getting a lot of oil from fields that we've now discovered but not developed, and surprisingly, fields yet to be discovered. This is an 08 slide, and notice that they believed that by 2030, they believed then that we would be getting about 106 million barrels per day. The next slide, <coughs> by the same people, the World Energy Outlook, they now have decreased their uh, projection of what we'll have. By 2035, five years later, they say we're only going to have 96 million barrels per day. Uh, they now believe that the, we're only going to be getting, what, about a fourth of the oil from the fields we're pumping uh, uh, now. We'll be getting about a fourth of that in, in uh, 2035. And the wedges of the, of the oil yet to be, fields yet to be developed and fields yet to be discovered has grown even further. Uh, the next chart kind of puts this in context and tells us what the probability is that we're going to find all that new oil. This is the oil chart and what it shows, the vertical bars show the discovery of oil through the years, most of it in the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s. And from 1980 on, we every year used more oil than we found. We were then dipping into reserves. This was an 04 chart and what it shows is that they predicted quite cor correctly we would be peaking oil about now. A 10 billion barrel find of oil is pretty big, sir. Uh, every 12 days, the world uses a billion barrels of oil. That means that 10 billion barrel find lasts the world 120 days. Big deal. The next chart, General, really illuminates your area. It shows what the world would look like, and boy, you own most of it, if the size of the countries were relative to the amount of oil they have. Now, you've got to shrink uh, Saudi Arabia a bit because the WikiLeaks of a couple of weeks ago indicated they've been fibbing about how much oil they have. I suspect that most of OPEC has. But look at the size of China and India there, how small they are. The next chart. Uh, again, very relative to your area of responsibility, shows the choke points uh, where the oil must flow through if they're going to get to other parts of the world. The 2010, the next slide, the 2010 Quadrennial Defense Review makes a very sane statement. Energy security means having assured access to reliable supplies of energy and the ability to protect and deliver sufficient energy to meet operational needs. The next chart, uh, this is Joint uh, Operating Environment 2010 says, even assuming more effective conservation measures, the world would need to add roughly the equivalent of Saudi Arabia's current energy production every seven years. Uh, General, those two wedges of developing fields we've now found but not developed and fields yet to be discovered, that is pure wishful thinking, sir. That ain't going to happen. Uh, the next, the second statement, there is severe energy crunch is inevitable. Put a period there because there is no amount of money that you can spend to produce oil that isn't there. And the last statement is just plain wrong, because oil has already peaked conventional oil in 2006. Sir, why is not this the perfect storm? 
The United States owns only 2% of the world's oil. We use 25% of the world's oil. We're not buying oil anywhere in the world. China is buying oil reserves every in the world, everywhere in the world that they can find them. The peaking of oil occurs just at the time the developing world, the developed world, us and the rest of the developed world, needs more oil to come out of the recession. The developing world, India and China, are demanding hugely increased amounts of oil. Um, the, the WikiLeaks things indicate there's less oil out there than we thought was out there, and there's huge unrest in, in, in your area of responsibility. Sir, what do you think the odds are that we can avoid armed conflict over oil in the future? Uh, Congressman Bartlett, I, I have, because I'm born an eternal optimist, I think it's always a matter of choice. Uh, that said, I think that you highlight a critical point. Certainly history would uh, give a more pessimistic response than I just gave uh, if we studied uh, the results of competition like this. I think it does point to the need for uh, for looking at every energy resource that we have, not just oil, because this is, as you point out, inevitable. Uh, but I, I think that there are different ways to solve problems, and I think we may actually be on the cusp of a time when, if all this change goes in a positive direction, you may find collaboration. If it goes otherwise, then, uh, then we're going to have to be ready. Thank you. Mr. Johnson. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. We've reached the period of peak oil, I think is what uh, Mr. Uh, Bartlett uh, was saying. And uh, we're going to have to develop new sources of energy. What impact does it have if we're not doing basic research uh, into uh, that area? Uh, either one of you, I'd like a response. Because, of course, we've been uh, cutting, we've been busy cutting, cutting federal spending uh, in every uh, place other than uh, defense. Um, how does uh, our vulnerability increase commensurate with the cuts that uh, uh, are being uh, proposed, the drastic cuts being proposed to the budget science? Can you respond? So from a, from a special operations perspective, I'll just tell you that we can uh, shift to alternative energy measures uh, as rapidly as they can be developed and operationalized. Uh, but I'm not an expert on the pace of that or the probability of that. Uh, but we certainly would look forward to development that would move us in that direction. Uh, Congressman, I think that uh, I can't draw a direct line. I'm probably not competent to draw a direct line between basic research and developing new sources. But clearly, developing new sources reduces our dependency on the oil. And if we do so, it reduces the potential for the uh, outcome that Congressman Bartlett just mentioned of, of conflict over uh, diminishing resources, sir. Thank you. Um, we have a role that we have uh, adopted, that is, of uh, global policemen. And our forward posture around the world will have to be curtailed as we adapt to the new realities of our time. And one of those uh, realities is uh, our energy uh, or, or our dependence on uh, uh, current means of uh, energy production. and. Um, and also, uh, we've been nation building for the last uh, uh, decade uh, in one of the most inhospitable and lawless places on earth. I'm talking about Afghanistan. We have to accelerate the end game. We've got to achieve a, 
an acceptable security environment uh, soon. That means we cannot merely increase the capacity of the Afghan government to kill its enemies. We have to aggressively shrink the ranks of its em enemies by bringing them back into the political fold. Uh, General Mathis, as General Petraeus, your predecessor at CENTCOM, has said, quote, you don't end an industrial strength insurgency by killing or capturing all the bad guys. You have to kill, capture, or turn the bad guys, and that means reintegration and reconciliation. As we approach the 10th anniversary of the Bonn Conference, where are we on the reconciliation piece of that strategy? What will a likely political settlement look like? And uh, General Mathis, do you anticipate that we will have a sizable military footprint in Afghanistan through 2014? Uh, Congressman, uh, military success such as we are seeing today, undeniable on the battlefield, sets the conditions for improved economics, improved governance. You cannot have those two unless you have military uh, protection of the, of the people. So once you have that, we have a multi-pronged approach here. One is transition, where we actually start transitioning this July to a Afghan-led security structure in certain districts and provinces based on conditions, as the Commander-in-Chief has said. That transition is aided and abetted by reintegration of young men who are giving up the fight, recognizing they aren't on the winning side, they no longer want to be with people who simply caused mayhem, and they see this new government gaining traction. So from the bottom up, you see reintegration, Reconciliation is top-down. As we set the conditions where this enemy realizes they can't wait us out, and the Lisbon Declaration where we said that the, the, uh, the united force that's on the battlefield will be there through 2014 has helped in this regard, it means that they have got to start reconciling. We don't reconcile with our friends. We reconcile with our enemies. So we are going to be working with the Taliban to bring them over as they sense they no longer have an opportunity for military victory. Uh, in order to come over, uh, you asked what it, the settlement would look like. I think it's very simple. The Taliban must abandon al-Qaeda, they must quit using violence, and they must accept the Afghan constitution. At that point, they're welcome back into the process, a process led by the Afghan people as it must be. Uh, but we will have significant military forces there for the near future. We will start bringing them down in July, but we are committed through 2014, by which time all of the districts and, and provinces will have transitioned over to Afghan lead. I think that addressed your question, sir. Thank, Thank you, you, General. Thank you. Mr. Thornberry. Thank you, Chairman, and uh, thank you both for, for being here. Admiral Olson, I want to join in the accolades and the gratitude for your service in uh, this capacity at a very important time uh, when you have headed uh, the Special Operations Command. Uh, we, we've, the country's been fortunate to have you there at, at this point in particular. I notice in your written testimony uh, you talk about the shortage of readily available local training ranges for SOCOM, and, and even that too often our operators have to travel to train, which means that is even more time away from their families and, and, and away from their homes. Does, does SOCOM have a plan to improve that situation? Uh, this is obviously an area where we can help, um, but we want to be consistent with what's in, in the long-term planning of, of SOCOM. Thank you, sir. Uh, I would say um, our intent is larger than our plan at this point. Uh, Special Operations Command at Milcon can build ranges, but we don't own them. Uh, we are building them in facilities that then we, we need to use, and in many cases we can't build the ranges that, uh, we, we can't build all of the ranges that we need. We have to use ranges, pre-existing ranges uh, that are controlled by the Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marine Corps. As you know, well, we are in some places where those ranges are available nearby, but we're in some places where there just aren't ranges uh, nearby. 
And so my intent is, is to provide for our force as much as possible ranges on which they can train in the day and be home uh, that night in order to, to reduce this, uh, this pressure on the forcer. It is within our MILCON budget to make some progress on that, but we are also going to have to continue to work with each of the services to arrive at a better means of coordinating use. Well, we want to assist, in, I want to assist in that effort anyway, uh, and, and I think this committee can be of some help. Uh, General Mattis, yesterday Secretary Clinton testified in front of the Senate Appropriations Committee that Iran is, quote, very much involved, end quote, with the opposition in Yemen. They're reaching out to the opposition movement in Bahrain. They're having contacts with some of the opposition groups uh, in Egypt through Hezbollah and, and Hamas. And Hamas. Uh, I guess the question is, do, have you seen reporting uh, that would support that? And if there is increased Iranian influence in, some, in those places, what effect does that have on our counterterrorism efforts and our mill-to-mill -mill connections? Thank you, sir. Uh, I have seen the reporting that Secretary Clinton referred to. Uh, we have seen some influence in Yemen. In Bahrain, I think uh, the Iranian, the Tehran regime, not the Iranian people, but the regime there uh, is incapable of not minding its own business, and I have no doubt that they are engaged uh, in any way they can. That's not to say the bulk of the people in Bahrain are in any way stooges of the Iranians. The Bahraini people uh, are quite capable of, uh, of making up their own minds without uh, malign influence out of Tehran. Uh, I think what the effect of this is, uh, is negative on our counterterrorism campaign, but I would also say that this simply gives more credence to us staying relentlessly engaged across the region so that we not allow vacuums. And this means uh, we're going to have to stay engaged at times when we don't know the outcome of certain processes that these countries are going through in this transition time. Okay. Um, let me ask one other thing. Additionally, yesterday was an article about Central Command uh, and some information operations. Um, I, I know there's not much we can talk about uh, on, on, in that area, but I would be curious for either of you whether you have had your lawyers review the applicable laws and procedures to, to see whether they are consistent, whether they hamper your ability to do what you would like to do and, and might need some updating or, and modernizing. This article, for example, uh, cites some operators complaining that there are too many hoops to run through and, and so forth. And, and I think one area in our bailiwick is looking at the law and, and seeing if it is consistent with operations, but of course also our values. And my question is, have you had lawyers look at that issue? Uh, for CENTCOM, we have had our judge advocates and our lawyers uh, look at this uh, and the authorities we need to conduct these operations. We consider that in today's changing world, these are now traditional military activities. They're no longer something that can only be handled by Voice of America or someone like that. So we do need the authorities. We're very careful right now to stay strictly within the guidelines of the law, and we do have uh, uh, ongoing blog fights, you know, where we go in and we, we, uh, we contradict inaccurate information, and it's fully attributable at this point. Thank you. Um, Mrs. Castor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the Tampa Bay area is a very patriotic community, and we are very uh, proud to to host SOCOM and CENCOM uh, on, at McDill Air Force Base, and uh, particularly uh, Admiral Olson uh, being there for the past few years. You're just a beloved member of the community now, and uh, they'll be very sorry to see you, see you transition out. Uh, so I'll be a little parochial just to begin my questions. The, along with my colleague, uh, Congressman Bill Young, over the past few years, uh, there's been great investment that has matched the growth and missions of CENCOM and SOCOM at McDill, uh, but it still appears to be uh, unfinished. Uh, parking issues, uh, other complications right there. Can you spend just a, a quick moment on 
Uh, I know that the greater mail con needs for SOCOM are all across the, all, all across the country, but there uh, on McDill Air Force Base, what would be the top of your list that remains unfinished uh, at this point? Ma'am, as, as you know, we have had uh, a fair amount of construction over the last several years, and we have some programmed in the future. Uh, we have just, as you mentioned, built a parking garage, which we probably should have built first. Uh, but in, in the end, it's, uh, it's serving us quite well. Uh, and we are finishing up a, a, up a couple of other projects. Uh, I think that we are always, uh, we are in the mode now of, of upgrading and recapitalizing rather than expanding uh, within, the, within the, the base. And we are always interested in improvements to the base itself that, on which we are tenants uh, that improve the quality of life and the quality of service for our people. Uh, Ma'am, as you know, uh, we're, thanks to the Congress, we're getting a new headquarters there to replace one that's really getting a little, uh, little age. Uh, the, only, the only thing I think I need right now is an issue we're working, and that's for quality of life is a parking area so our folks don't have to walk a half mile or, or further to get to work. But uh, the Congress has taken very good care of us, and we have excellent facilities coming online by spring. Thank you very much. And I also wanted to ask you about uh, Pakistan. There, uh, we provide a lot of support to, to Pakistan through coalition support funds, through foreign military financing, Pakistan counterinsurgency and counterinsurgency capability funds. Uh, and yet we still were struggling to get uh, the, the Pakistanis and, and the Army to really be a better partner in helping us disrupt the Taliban um, headquarters or where they're, where they're meeting and, and plotting. We, they could be a better partner in the Fatah areas. Uh, they need to, to continue to reorient themselves uh, from India towards Afghanistan and the other real threats in the area. What, what are you doing to, you know, with this great uh, investment that the U.S. puts up with those, those funds I previously mentioned, what kind of conditions do you put on uh, that military assistance and aid to continue to convince the Pakistanis to be a better, uh, more attentive partner? Uh, it's an excellent question. Uh, the funds themselves, we track them. Uh, we track them. I've got some very uh, keenly attentive field grade officers in Islamabad. They work daily with the Pakistani counterparts, and they, we routinely require additional uh, confirmation that, in fact, the equipment we're giving or the money we're giving is going to support those operations in the Fatah against our common enemies. They're, that money is tracked very, very carefully. Uh, I think the, uh, the growing rapport, especially with our, our hammer and anvil operation, where we're doing something on our side of the border, they're doing something on their side, collaborating now down to lower ranking officers as they talk back and forth across the border. We've had some dramatic successes lately. I just came back from a meeting that Admiral Mullen and General Kiani held. Uh, we met in Oman with General Petraeus, Admiral Olson, and I uh, and several of General Kiani's officers and, and the American officers. And I was impressed by the level of rapport between General Petraeus and General Kiani. I think the point to look at, ma'am, is that after 1989 or 1990, we walked away from this area. During that period, history did not stand still. And when we came in, back in in 2001, there was a sense of abandonment by the Americans. That has engendered a certain level of distrust that we have had to work to overcome. It's not perfect. Uh, in any war, as a British prime minister put it, the only thing more difficult than fighting with allies is fighting without them. Well, we have 48 allies in this battle, and Pakistan is the key ally. And they have suffered right now uh, over 2,700 killed. They have suffered over 8,600 wounded. They're civilians. They've lost a presidential candidate, Mrs. Budo. They have lost nearly 30,000 civilian casualties. So it's not a perfect solution in the high country. Your question is valid, but I see it improving, and I think that's, that's the trend line we have to be focused on, what they are doing up there. 
Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Conaway. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, Adam Olson, let me also add um, thank you from a uh, grateful nation for what you've done and uh, standing in the breach. And actually, thank you for the men and women you lead uh, who do the toughest of what needs to be out there. Your comment, and I'll get it wrong, but you said the fabric is strong, weave is tight, but it's showing some wear on the team. Um, in the rest of the forces, we understand dwell time and, and, and the standard that we set for deployments, and we're trying to get uh, two to one active duty, four to one. I, I, I think that's a proper metric. I'm struggling with a, a metric for your team uh, in the terms so that we can see what a standard would look like and then compare that to what you're actually doing. And, and I don't know if you track operations per deployment or you know, some such, uh, because in your, in your realm, I don't think just deployment is, is, uh, is the same as a deployment in other areas because of the every night thing that your folks do. And so have you guys looked at some sort of a standard that says if we had all the SOCOM folks we needed, they would be deployed. During that deployment, they would have X number of operations, and then they would come home and be there for some period of time in order to, to heal the mind, heal the bodies quicker, but heal the mind for all the stuff that goes on. Is there some sort of a metric you can help us understand so we can compare where, you are, where we are with where we'd want to get to? Thank you, sir. We've done a lot of work on metrics, and um, we are exceeding the pace of deployment against all of the metrics that we've uh, worked up. There are a thousand different ways to get at this, no one solution, but we're trying to, we're trying to figure out all of the ways that we can chip away at, uh, at each person gone each day to see how we can back, uh, back away from that uh, in the many small ways that, that ultimately would make uh, a real difference. Uh, but the, the short answer is yes, sir, we, we've worked the metrics hard. Can you, um, in, the, in the rest of the force, if they're only one-to-one -one dwell time versus deployment and the goal is two-to-one, I, I have a sense of where we've got to get to. Can you share some of those metrics with us as to what the scope of the, the shortfall is, either the shortfall in folks and or an overcommitment of the team that you know, we work on both ends? Uh, but I don't have any feel for what you're... No. Yes, sir. We are, we are working all ends, all sides. Uh, we, we, we try to build to three to one. We understand surge deployments at two to one. We have a red line of one to one, but certain elements of our force are deployed more often than that. Sir. Okay. Well, if there is a, a better way to help members of Congress, I know you understand it and you get it. If there's a better way for you to help us understand it, create a sense of urgency as to what what is out there is being helpful. Uh, General Mattis, uh, working off Ms. Castor's comments, you may have said during your opening comments the great benefit we had for 30 years of mill-to-mill -mill, uh, interaction with the Egyptian army, military, excuse me, and the benefit that appears to have paid off uh, in the way they've reacted throughout this change in government. Can you talk to us, and you mentioned briefly that we basically ceased mill-to-mill -mill conversations in Pakistan for a 10 or 12 year period. Can you uh, what's going on? We've been there now 10 years almost, so we maybe recoup that, but there's a whole tranche of folks who grew up without having any contact with America. They're now in charge. Can you talk to us a little briefly about how that's impacting our military mill as well as what the current dust up with our uh, uh, civilian, with, uh, with diplomatic immunity being held is, is having on your team? I can, sir, and it builds on Congresswoman Castor's question. Because when you have, from 1989 to 2001, uh, broken contacts, those officers continue up in the ranks. Uh, like I said, nothing stands still. Fortunately, the officers right now in command are still ones who went to Leavenworth, who went to Maxwell, uh, who we did have relations with. Uh, unfortunately, when they move 140 of the thousand of their troops, a quarter of their army off the Indian border and up into the high country, the majority of them are, are led, of course, by lieutenants, captains, majors, lieutenant colonels, who we did not have that rapport with. Thanks to Admiral Olson's folks, we very quietly uh, work uh, with uh, our Pakistan counterparts and one by one, we are rebuilding the, the bonds of trust. But it's going to take a while to recover from the very point that you made, years of uh, basically disenchantment between yeah. Any direct impact on the, the issue with the uh, diplomat who's got immunity and being held with your 
things you're trying to get done day in and day out? Uh, no, sir, I don't, I don't believe so. All right. Thank you, gentlemen. Bill. Appreciate it. You're back. Thank you, Mr. Langevin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, General Mattis and Commander Olson, I want to thank you for uh, your testimony today. And uh, the Congress and the American people certainly owe uh, the both of you a great debt of gratitude and, and the people that serve uh, under you. And, um, and uh, obviously, you're, you're very uh, likely currently and, and, and in the future to remain the very tip of the spear uh, in the fight against global terrorism. I want to thank you uh, both for your service. Uh, Admiral Olson, um, SOCOM sits at uh, a unique juncture uh, in the military uh, structure in that it can benefit from ongoing efforts uh, throughout the services as well as uh, find its own unique ways uh, internally to accomplish the mission. I would like to focus a little bit, if I could, on your, your science and technology efforts. In uh, your testimony, you briefly uh, mentioned SOCOM science uh, and technology efforts. And I would like you, to, if you could, to take a moment to more fully explain how uh, SOCOM contributes to uh, and benefits from science and technology efforts within DOD. Uh, can you, in particular, explain instances where SOCOM undertook uh, its own effort, s and efforts uh, uh, in areas where time-sensitive requirements uh, exist? Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, Special Operations Commander is a relatively small force, um, and, and our needs are often quite peculiar to Special Operations. Uh, force requirements. So we do have an uh, R&D, uh, uh, research and development, a science and technology budget that we use to invest in, in some items that are sort of invented for special operations purposes, but we also use that to contribute to service investment in order to ensure that the services are making special operations considerations in some of their development projects. I have a senior science and, techno and technology advisor uh, on my staff. He's in good contact with all of the services and the laboratories uh, to ensure that our, our investment in that is, uh, is, is made as wisely as we can, sir. Can, I see that um, your, your research and development uh, testing and evaluation budget uh, has been significantly increased uh, this year up to uh, uh, $496 million. Can you describe some of the, the RDT and AE uh, efforts that you are undertaking? Yes, sir, I do. Uh, these are the, some of that is a general increase in, in R and D and, and science and technology, recognizing the special operations peculiar needs for that. Uh, but this year is a bit of an anomaly. Uh, much of this year's increase in science and technology budget is directly related to um, to a an efficiency initiative that we made in order to back away from one sort of ponderous program and invest in a, in a family of undersea mobility vehicles. And there's a, a, a peculiar requirement for uh, science and technology R&D money this year for that. Are there any other examples that you could, that you could cite for us? Uh, sir, th there, are, there are many examples. Most of them are quite small, but I think one that we're particularly proud of now is, uh, is a, a solar energy panel project that we've installed in a remote village in Afghanistan uh, as part of a very small presence of special forces in that region, the difficulty of getting uh, fossil fuel supplies uh, to that region. And, and so the success of that is, has been encouraging. But there are any number of, of other projects that, again, are quite small, quite limited, no big appetite in the big services for what it is we are developing uh, time. So our R&D budget is actually spread pretty thin across a number of projects. Sure. I'm pleased to hear you mention the, uh, the alternative energy uh, uh, project uh, in particular. I think that's uh, important for a variety of reasons, but in, in particular, uh, keeping our uh, supply lines to a minimum. If we don't have to transport fossil fuels, obviously, uh, any more than necessary at the front lines, then uh, it keeps people safe and uh, keeps us uh, more independent, mobile, and effective. So um, that I know that the other services are looking at, uh, at developing those tools as well. Uh, before my time runs out, uh, Admiral, let me just ask, you know, one of the most important distinctions with our Special Operations Command, uh, our Special Operations Community, is uh, the focus on irregular warfare. At the Naval uh, War College in Portsmouth, Rhode Island, we are lucky enough to have the Center for Irregular Warfare, uh, which works at educating our special operators uh, uh, on the culture and strategic insights into the, uh, the very areas they are uh, being deployed into. 
Uh, and they also host a Yale symposium, which brings together some of the best irregular warfare uh, education across the, the country. Um, often, however, the educational training can be overlooked, especially in a year of budgetary constraints. Uh, what is SOCOM uh, doing to ensure that our special operators receive a high quality uh, training education background that is critical for them uh, to remain the high uh, uh, performance fighting force that we require? Admiral, the gentleman's time has expired. Could you please answer that for the, that for the record? I would appreciate it. And I want to thank you both for your service, uh, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Turner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, General Mattis and Admiral Olson. Thank you for being here and for your leadership. Uh, I have three questions that I'm going to try to lump together and give to you in hopes of, of getting answers to all three of them. Uh, two are about Iraq and one is about Afghanistan. Uh, on Iraq yesterday, I met with uh, some brave government leaders from the Iraqi International Visitor Leadership Program that uh, represented local government and, and um, uh, state or canton level government. And during their visit, um, one, they expressed great appreciation to the United States um, and also then great concern um, about what will occur as uh, our forces are drawn uh, from Iraq. And, um, voicing, I know, the concern that you have of um, interference that might arise from their neighbors, particularly Iran. But in, in doing so, they also uh, indicated that uh, the provincial reconstruction teams that uh, had been uh, deployed throughout Iraq made a big impact and a, were great assistance in their ability to uh, ensure that uh, they could make uh, a transition and remain stable. Uh, they reported that several of those are closing, and they are very concerned about them. They wanted me to raise the issue um, with you, gentlemen, to see to what extent that you see that um, um, the PRTs may be able to remain uh, and continue to have a role. Also, yesterday we had a hearing in the uh, Government Reform National Security Subcommittee on the U.S. military leaving Iraq. Is the State Department ready? I would love any comments that you have concerning uh, the State Department's uh, efforts and the uh, significant amount of contractors that they are going to be uh, employing for uh, security forces, some 17,000. Um, my question on Afghanistan is I would like for you to con uh, comment on our efforts to reduce the drug trade. Um, in 2006, General James Jones, then the Supreme Allied Commander of Europe, stated that, quote, the Achilles heel of, of Afghanistan is the narcotics problem. I think the uncontrolled rise of the spread of narcotics, the business that it brings in, the money that it generates is being used to fund the insurgency, the criminal, criminal elements, anything to bring chaos and disorder. He also says that it funds the corruption in the police, the corruption in local governments, corruption in, at high levels of government. Now, I love, gentlemen, to hold up this chart. This is a chart of the historical production of uh, opium production in Afghanistan. If you fold the chart, you can see that looking at the years when we first got to Afghanistan, that the subsequent years uh, up through 2009 are almost double uh, what has occurred prior. When General uh, James Jones made this quote in 2006, um, the level of 2006 is about the same it was in 2009. So as, even though we say it's being reduced and coming down, it's still at astronomical levels and nearly double of our first two years in Afghanistan. I really think it gets to the heart of our ability uh, to turn our circ our, uh, the circumstances around in Afghanistan, and I'd, I'd love to hear your comments on those issues. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, thank you. Uh, on the PRTs, uh, they, they have got to come out, sir. This is something that we did to help Iraq get back on their feet. Uh, they have an educated population. They now have a government that they voted in. It was a very close election, so it took a while to get it set up. But these, are, these PRTs, as you know, provincial reconstruction teams, were there to bring government services during the tumultuous period as we fought it out with the enemy. Uh, th that period is pretty much over now. The enemy can still uh, set off an explosion anywhere in the country. Uh, that's just the kind of mentality that they have. But the Iraqi security forces have proven themselves capable, I think, to maintain security to a point that it's now the responsibility of the Iraqi government. Uh, is the State Department ready? Not yet, but I am confident they're on the right track. We have one of the finest ambassadors we have served with anywhere in Ambassador Jeffries, and I think the 17,000 number, while this is still tentative, I believe that number is the total number on the ground from Department of State and the number of contracted uh, security personnel will be uh, less than half that. Uh, I'm, uh, 
Excuse me. Go ahead, sir. That, that was the number that was being used yesterday in the hearing. So I, I'm not. I'm not certain either, but uh, we'll certainly. If I can get back to you for the record, then I need to also check the numbers and make certain I'm giving you accurate uh, data here. Uh, but I think that right now the State Department and the Defense Department are working very closely together. I co-hosted with the Deputy Secretary of State a conference here in late January where we, we got together with all the right people from the military and from Department of State, and we are working right down to what issues still need resolution, who's going to be responsible for them. It's on the right track, sir. It's going to be difficult, but we're on the right track. On Afghanistan, I'll just tell you that we are making progress, significant progress, now that we've taken the Helmand River Valley away from the enemy. Thank you, uh, Mr. Garamendi. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. My apologies to uh, Admiral and General for being late. It's one of those days. Uh, and I may pick up issues that you've already covered. If so, uh, you can move quickly through them and, and go from there. Uh, the first deals with uh, what is presently taking place in the Levant, Egypt, Libya, Tunisia. What, uh, what's our posture there? What can we expect? Uh, how does it relate to the work that uh, both of you gentlemen do? Uh, I understand the Navy's nearby now, and uh, uh, maybe one or the other of you will want to take this one on. Sir, Libya is not in my, my region. Egypt is. The Secretary has just given orders a few hours ago to commence an airlift of Egyptians who have been forced outside of Libya into Tunisia to help them get back home again. Uh, the reason we're doing this is, number one, we can, and number two, I think it's uh, indicative of the continuing close military-to-military -military relationship that we are trusted in that part of the world to be the ones who can fly military air airlift in, pick up refugees, fly them to another country going past a country that's in disarray right now. So we are helping where we can on the humanitarian side, sir. Uh, that would be in the Tunisia-Libyan situation. Could you speak to the Egyptian situation, since that is your turf? I can, sir. Uh, we've maintained close relations with the Egyptian military. They have served with honor. They continue to serve with honor. I spoke to our ambassador. And she, uh, yesterday, she explained to me that uh, the military is carrying out its caretaker role, and our relationship with that military strengthens them in that role, that they will turn this over to a civilian elected government, and we still anticipate six months. I think it's ambitious for any country to go through all that they have to go through to meet that timeline, but that is the military's commitment. I talked to General Anand, the chief of defense of Egypt, a couple weeks ago. And he assured me that that is their intention, to, to keep the order, to not uh, in any way restrict uh, peaceful demonstrations, protect them, in fact, and protect the process toward a, uh, a democracy. Apparently, the military-to-military uh, -military relationship has been very beneficial. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Okay. Um, Admiral, I don't know if you have anything to do with what's going on a little further to the west of Egypt. If so, you can maybe bring us up to date. If not, we'll just let it go. Sir, from a Special Operations Command perspective, I'll just say that we have offered the menu of capabilities that Special Operations can contribute to either turn down the heat or respond to a flare-up. And so the Commander of CENTCOM and the Commander of AFRICOM have those, sir. Ready and willing to go. Does that mean, well, we don't know what it means, do we? That is the level of engagement that might be uh, forthcoming. I will let that one go until we get some more information. I do have a question about Pakistan. It seems to me that uh, while Afghanistan remains our major um, area or theater of operation, Pakistan is becoming increasingly um, of increased concern. Could you uh, brief us on Pakistan and, and the situation as you see it in Pakistan, particularly the destabilization that is apparently going on? Frankly, I, I am concerned about Pakistan. We have very strong military-to-military -military links. Uh, we are working better than ever right now against our common enemies up along the border area. 
Uh, my concern with Pakistan is more along the lines of, of uh, financial challenges for the government, of the disarray of the civilian government. Uh, it's more along the governance and economic lines is my point. Uh, that's not to say there is not a severe enemy problem there. Uh, they have killed thousands of Pakistani troops, wounded thousands more, and attacked and killed and wounded upwards of nearly 30,000 civilians. So it is, a, it is a concern. The Pakistan military is doing well. They have sustained for 24 months now uh, an offensive against our enemies uh, that uh, has taken a quarter of their army up into the high country, some of the most forbidding and difficult terrain I've ever operated in. But at the same time, I think the, the problems are much deeper and much broader than purely military can solve. And, and my time is up, but therein lies my basic concern. It's the radicalization of Pakistan by all that's going on within the country and around it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the extra 13 seconds. Thank you, Mr. Whitman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Admiral Olson, General Mattis, thank you so much for joining us today, and thank you for your service to our nation. And Admiral Olson, a special thanks to you and a distinguished career. Uh, wow, what, a, what, what, what accomplishments. The first uh, Navy SEAL to be SOCOM commander, the first Navy SEAL to attain the rank of four-star admiral. Thanks again for that distinguished service. I want to begin with you, Admiral Olson. Looking at where we've come, with our special forces over the years. We know in the last 37 years that force has grown significantly. It has expanded in its scope and its expertise. You know, back in the 70s, nobody really knew what a Navy SEAL was or a Green Beret or a PJ. Today, they have an expansive range of operations and they have become the weapon of choice in this 21st century of asymmetric uh, engagement. So I wanted to kind of get your perspective on where will special operations go, special forces go, in this next century? You know, what are the challenges out there that we face? And specifically, how do we make sure that we are doing all we can to recruit and train the best and brightest so we indeed have that force structure, that capability in years to come? And, and you know, we're in a pretty special time in this nation's history, special in the sense that we've had now over 10 years of pretty high ops tempo deployment for our special forces. How do we make sure that that force is going to be structured to meet the challenges into the future? Thank you, sir. Uh, I have a lot of answer that, uh, <laughs> to, to that question. I'll, I'll keep it brief. Mm -hmm. uh, first, our recruiting and training is, uh, is going very well. We, we are getting people who are smarter, harder, smitter, uh, fitter, stronger than, uh, than ever before, and, and at least is motivated. And I'm quite satisfied with the quality of the force and the quality of our training. We need to do more to ensure that we are retaining them. Uh, for as long as we need for them to serve. This is quite specialized work. We do it best heavily in their training, and the longer that we can keep them with us, uh, the better, even well beyond the, the normal 20-year military uh, retirement point. Um, in terms of the employment of Special Operations Forces, it, it's, it's a big, complex world. I think the threat of, uh, of, of massive Army versus Army uniformed formations against uniformed formations kind of warfare is decreasing. And the, and the probability of, as you said, asymmetric cyber uh, non-traditional warfare is increasing. It's, it's very much special operations commands um, within our portfolio to, 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 to be out there around the world turning down the, the global heat. Um, we are in many countries on any given day at the invitation of other nations to help provide them local capability that contributes to regional stability. Uh, so, in, in my way of describing it, we have, we have worked very hard in our sort of shoot, move, communicate, network kind of skills. Uh, our investment now is in our understanding, make sure that we're in the right places for the right reasons, doing the right things with the ability to properly predict the outcomes. General Mattis, I want to ask a little bit about what we're facing in Iraq. As you know, we're right at the face of more drawdowns. Uh, that's quickly approaching. We're at 50,000 now and with no agreement past uh, the end of 2011 as far as what our, what our manning is going to be there in Iraq. The Inspector General for DOD 
pointed out some concerns about Iraqi capabilities and ISF capabilities going into the future and they pointed out that with that transition there might be little time to develop logistical systems and industrial capabilities that may leave the ISF and Iraqi forces with a lack of readiness in what they are going to be facing down the road and they also noted some additional gaps in military training, special operations and airspace manage management. Within that context the question then becomes how do we make sure that those forces are going to be ready and, and, and what are our forces doing or, or in making sure that that transition is going to be a smooth one and that we don't lose uh, what we have gained there and we want to make sure that the ISF and Iraqi forces are able to maintain uh, what we have worked so hard uh, to build there. So I want to get your perspective on, on where, where, what challenges we're facing with that transition. I, I think you summed up the challenges pretty, uh, pretty well, sir. I, the three biggest challenges, logistics, including maintenance, intelligence, and intelligence fusion, and how they would use that for their special forces, their security forces, to continue an unrelenting attack against the enemies, the terrorists who are in the country, and still capable of dramatic attacks, and of course air sovereignty. They will not have an air force yet. Uh, but uh, we are using every day, working with them every day. We have specialized training programs uh, for certain units to bring, if we can't bring everyone up, can we bring up a cadre, certain units up to full capability? That too is going to be challenging. Candidly, it's going to be very difficult. I think there will still be loose ends by December, but absent a uh, request from the Iraqi government and agreement by the U.S. government to stay longer, we are projected to come out with uh, pretty much 99.9% .9 of our troops. There may be a small Office of Security Cooperation that would try to carry on some of the things that you just mentioned. Chairman, are you back? Thank you. Ms. Hanavusa. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Admiral, for your years of service. And Thank you, General Mathis, for being here. I'd like to first begin with uh, General Mathis. You made an interesting comment when I was here earlier, and you, you said that though not within, I think, your region, the Israel-Palestinian situation really affects uh, your ability uh, within what you're tr trying to do. Could you expand that for me? What, what is it about it, and what kind of stability would you like to see? Yes, ma'am, I can. Uh, the extremist elements have seized this issue and they use it for recruiting. So if Middle East peace can be achieved, a two-state solution, which has been proposed by several American administrations, uh, embraced by many moderates across the region and in the UN, if this two-state solution can be achieved, then what you do is you remove this issue from the extremists. I think it's pretty clear to everyone that Iranian uh, leaders in Tehran don't care a whit about Palestinian Arabs. But they use this issue, and because other extremists use it, it limits the ability of some of our friends in the region to come out and support us because of the lack of progress on this issue. I think that in the terms of long-term security for Israel, and for the Palestinian people to have their rights, we're going to have to make progress on the two-state solution. General, um, we all know that uh, there's such a strong sense about the relationship that we have with Egypt, especially the relationship the military has developed and nurtured for 30 some odd years. Do you see the potential for a similar kind of relationship developing in any of the other areas like Lebanon, Yemen, um, er, er, Baran, er, any, any of those areas, do you see that we can do that or duplicate that relationship elsewhere? I think we have that relationship in a couple of area, uh, nations in my region, ma'am. Uh, I would start with Kuwait, where I was with Admiral Olson last week for the 20th anniversary of the battle that freed that country. Uh, I think that there were many, as many American flags at times in some parts of the young people out uh, celebrating that night before as there were Kuwaiti flags in Bahrain where we have had our fleet headquarters for 5th Fleet since the late 1940s. 
uh, in the midst of all the uh, turmoil going on there as, as reformers and, and others uh, peacefully protest, by and large. Uh, there's been no anti-Americanism there. We have a very strong relationship. We have very quiet and very robust mill-to-mill -mill relationship with the United Arab Emirates, with, uh, with Qatar. Uh, I can go on, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Uh, I think you mentioned Iran. I could not imagine it right now. No, no, I, I mispronounced uh, Bahrain. Oh, okay. I, then, right, then, right. Right. I, I imagine. I right. Thought, no, no, it wasn't Iran. Sorry. Yes, ma'am. But uh, yes, ma'am, we, we have very good mill to mill relationship, and there's more than that. I can go on at some length. Thank you. Admiral, one of the things I'm looking at, because this is a budget briefing, is I'm so accustomed to seeing end strength right up front, and I'm also interested, I always, I'm also accustomed to seeing the concept of the OCO budget versus the base budget. I was wondering, can you tell me with the figures that I've seen, is it 12.8 billion, which seems to be attributed to specific programs, what and how does this 2012 budget, what does it mean to what you're doing? Yes, ma'am. The, the 2012 budget request for Special Operations Command is actually $10.5 billion. Uh, this is about a 7 percent growth over 2011, and it permits us to continue the rate of growth uh, that we've been able to absorb. Uh, the demand is outpacing our ability to grow, but continuing this relatively good pace of growth uh, is essential. To us. This gives us a force structure of a, a we're at about 60,000 people now over the course of the next uh, four or five years. We will grow to about 68,000 people total. About a third of those are careers within our force and about two thirds are in our force for an assignment or two or three uh, over the course of, of their careers. In terms of OCO to base, uh, we are, I think, the highest percentage uh, user of OCO funds. We're about 36 percent of our total budget is in OCO. Um, and and as Secretary Gates testified yesterday that he is making moves to, in fact, transfer our entire OCO into our baseline budget over the next few years. Thank you very much, Adel. Thank you both. Thank you. Mr. West. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman and Admiral Olson and General Mattis. It really is an honor to be here with you today because you two are the epitome of the American warrior. Uh, my question, I think, is pretty simple. As I look across what's going on in the world right now, uh, Tunisia, Algeria, Libya, Egypt, Bahrain, Lebanon, Somalia, Gaza Strip, Yemen, Oman, Pakistan, Syria, Iran, there was one geographical thing that each one of those share, and that's the littorals. So as we begin to move away from this occupation nation building style of warfare, uh, my concern really is do we have the sufficient maritime forces? I know some of these countries may not be in your AOR, but I'm always concerned about the enemy being able to find the gaps and the seams by which he can exploit us. Do we really have the maritime forces to be able to have the power projection and potentially the forcible entry uh, capability to contend with uh, the rising threats that could come out of those nations? Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, we work the seams very closely. Uh, the combatant commanders, we speak to each other routinely. Our staffs are in constant contact. Uh, I get what I ask for. The concern you have, I think, is the longer term, and I will just say that your instincts are on target. I think I am right now commanding an increasingly maritime naval theater as these numbers of troops on the ground come down we are going to have to maintain a very robust naval presence. It's welcome, it's reinforcing, it is reassuring, and it tempers any mischief by certain people who might uh, want to get uh, meddlesome in other people's uh, issues. So from a special operations perspective, we are generally consumers and customers of the, maritime, of the, of the larger maritime forces. Uh, we ride and operate uh, from the ships when it's appropriate to do that, and therefore we depend on the com geographic combatant commanders uh, to request and provide those ships. I'll second what General Mattis said, is that generally when we are employed, the priority is high enough that we will get the maritime assets uh, that are required. Uh, but that's in the theater where we are now. It uh, may not be the same around the rest of the world, sir. 
Well, thank you, gentlemen, very much. And of course, being an old soldier is very hard for me to understand that and admit that that's an important uh, aspect. But subject to your, uh, I'll yield back to the chairman. By old soldier, he means he's served several years <laughs> when he's talking compared to an old guy like me. Um, Mr. Kaufman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, General Mattis, um, first of all, thank you for your distinguished uh, service uh, as a U.S. Uh, Central Command combatant commander. Uh, you had mentioned in an answer, and I want to clarify this, uh, about the Pakistani military, that the Pakistani military had been, words to the effect that you gave, had been conducting combat operations for uh, a two year, the last uh, two years uh, against our enemy. Uh, and I need to clarify that. Is it that they're conducting combat operations against the Pakistani Taliban? Because it's my understanding that, that the Afghan uh, Taliban have sanctuary inside of Pakistan and that they are not prosecuting operations against the Afghan Taliban. Uh, yes, sir. And it, they've been conducting the operations more than two years. It's not against all of those that we're up against. Uh, there are some they've not gone after. Uh, they're going after more today. It's in the last two years they've shifted 140,000 troops and have taken a much more aggressive role here. But you're quite correct. There are some that, uh, that they have not engaged. Thank you. Uh, Admiral Olson, I, I just want to thank you so much for your, uh, your service as the combatant commander for um, Special Operations uh, Command. And, and I think you mentioned that prospectively you saw that uh, you know that this it, that you saw future combat operations is probably not being uh, conventional force on force, but being of the more asymmetric uh, variety that would in fact involve uh, special uh, operations command. And in fact, the Secretary of Defense gave a recent speech uh, at West Point where he talked about uh, his doubts as to whether the United States in the future would engage in uh, in the kind of uh, heavy footprint operations as we're doing today in Iraq uh, and Afghanistan that I think he said words to the effect that we're not, he didn't see us as invading, uh, pacifying, and I think uh, building uh, countries in the future as, we, as we've done recently. Um, and General Mattis, that goes to you. I, I'm concerned that maybe we're too ambitious uh, in Afghanistan. I, I see that we have two objectives there uh, in order to meet U.S. security interests. I think number one uh, is uh, that we need to um, uh, not allow the Taliban to control the country uh, and, and that be a permissive environment for them uh, in which they could, they could leverage that uh, in, in helps of destabilizing uh, Pakistan by aiding the Taliban on the other side of the Durand line. Uh, and secondly, the ability to use uh, Afghanistan as a platform in which to, uh, quite frankly, seek out targets uh, uh, in, in the uh, tribal, uh, in the Fatah, uh, in, in Pakistan. But yet, if I look at the current policy, uh, it seems to me that we're um, establishing a governance that, that I'm concerned that, that doesn't necessarily uh, reflect the political culture of the country, but certainly reflects our values, that we're trying to restructure Afghan society, and that we're trying to build in the economy that they never had. And I refer to the uh, Afghan infrastructure fund uh, certainly as part of that. And, and I wonder if you can address that, because uh, um, uh, I'm just very concerned that, that we we're, uh, uh, perhaps have a policy that is um, more robust than is necessary to meet our security interest. Uh, thank you, sir. I engaged in the President's uh, policy review, strategy review in December. The, your question was one of the critical ones that we examined there. Are we doing more than we need to do? Again, we are there for our reasons, our national security reasons. Uh, when we didn't pay attention to it, we were attacked. And the Fatah area, the borderland e region there, remains the epicenter of uh, Osama bin Laden's efforts, obviously. So we fall back and say, what do we need to do to deny future attacks such as this? And we have very strictly looked even down to the, what are the key districts that we need to be focused on. It's not that we're all over the country. We're looking in every way, how do we ensure that the ends we require, we only commit the means necessary to do that. Now, it's not a precise science, and I think you can always find points where 
you might find where this doesn't quite seem to coincide. But basically, fundamentally, we are looking at how do we deny the enemy a position from which they can attack us in the future. Part of this is to ensure that as we pull out, as we will, we live in our wake something better than we left in 1989. It's got to be designed with Afghan unique, Afghanistan's unique uh, history, culture, geography, economic opportunity, all in mind. But right now, I'm confident that what we're doing is limited in scope to what needs to be done. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Brooks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you for being here before this Armed Services uh, Committee meeting. Uh, I had the opportunity last week to uh, participate in a congressional delegation trip to uh, Afghanistan and Pakistan. Uh, as a freshman, uh, I found it to be very eye-opening, um, very informative. Um, I would like to, uh, for the record, before I get to my questions, uh, point out a few things that I observed. First, I thought that our men and women in uniform uh, given the very challenging circumstances that they faced, were acting just as courageously and as professionally as anyone in America could hope for them to do. Um, that's a credit to them. It's also a credit to those uh, like you who have trained them so that they're able to handle the situations uh, that they face. Uh, similarly, I was impressed with our Foreign Service personnel who, uh, to a large degree, are responsible for uh, the nation building uh, that we're trying to do in both of those uh, two nations. Uh, third, in looking at the environment of Afghanistan in particular, I was struck by uh, the poverty of the Afghan people. Uh, I was told that there are roughly 30 million uh, population in Afghanistan. Um, in the rural areas, people were living in huts, uh, usually without windows. 15% um, literacy rate, i.e. 85% could neither read uh, nor write. Um, in the rural areas that I was fortunate to observe, uh, there appeared to be no electricity. Um, the roads in the rural areas uh, were dirt. Uh, and, and that brings me uh, to the Afghan economy. It was quite clear that the Afghan economy is nowhere near capable of being able to pay for its own defense, either militarily or uh, internal security forces, police, or what have you. And with that as a backdrop, uh, do you have a judgment as to how many years, in your opinion, it might be before the Afghan economy is strong enough for them to pay for their own internal security forces? Sir, I, I would have to give you a, uh, an estimate. Uh, I understand it would with, be an estimate. Please do. Uh, I would say it would be at least 10 years, and it will require international support throughout that 10-year period and perhaps longer? Yeah, I, I was informed by uh, some of the folks that we met with that it'd be in that neighborhood perhaps even as long as 15 or 20 years, um, which means it's basically going to be a long time. Uh, we hope for the best, but we uh, have to be prepared for the worst. It, with that as a backdrop, uh, do you have uh, any judgment as to how much America is going to have to pay over that next 10-year period of time uh, out of our own treasury? Uh, to be able to um, pay for the cost of the Afghan uh, security forces, the police, their military, or, or what have you? Sir, as we uh, fight this enemy and as governance picks up in areas that were once held by the Taliban, uh, there are economic opportunities, agricultural extraction, mineral extraction. Uh, there, there are opportunities for people there. I think we'll see a combination of the number of security forces needed dropping slightly as the enemy threat drops. And I think that uh, it, right now we have 49 nations engaged there. And as some start coming out, I, the, our foreign service officers who impressed you as they've impressed me will have to work with the foreign countries to make sure that as they pull their troops out, they maintain the kind of fiscal support that the international community has to give to a nation that with 30 years of warfare and hundreds of billions of dollars of damage to that country over those decades, simply going to take an international uh, commitment to get them back on their feet. And I am very confident it cannot be the United States alone. Well, do you have any judgment as to how much would be the United States share? I do not, sir. 
I, if it's just for the security forces, it'll cost us $12.8 billion this next year. That number will come down. I see that as a surge uh, right now of their forces. And at some point, once the enemy is beaten down, then they won't need that size of a force. So that amount should come down, too, as, uh, as the enemy threat recedes somewhat. But it, it's going to be a significant amount, I think, is, the, is where I would agree with you. It's going to take an international effort, not America alone. Thank you for your insight. Thank you. Mr. Wilson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and General Mattis, Admiral Olson. Thank you very much for your service. I was fortunate enough to be on the uh, congressional delegation with Congressman Brooks, and I want to join uh, with him in uh, commending the service members uh, we met. Uh, General Austin uh, gave us an uh, excellent briefing, General Petraeus, of course, uh, there in Baghdad and in Kabul. Uh, we also had the opportunity to visit uh, the sailors of the USS Lake Champlain in uh, Bahrain. Uh, it was just so encouraging uh, to me to see our quality troops. Also, I was encouraged um, because my former National Guard unit, the 218th Brigade, had been of the South Carolina National Guard, had been there in 2007, 2008, training the uh, Afghan National Security Forces. Um, the progress that I saw uh, of the personnel, the Afghan forces, and I know that the extraordinary defense minister, Abdul Wardak, has indicated that he wanted those forces if, uh, to be increased possibly to 300 and 78,000. And so, um, General, what, uh, is the, do we have the capability to partner uh, with a force that size with the current uh, personnel we have? Uh, if the President makes the decision to uh, support President Karzai's effort to grow the force, uh, as, General War as Minister Wardak told you, uh, yes, we have the capability to do so with the forces that we have there. And, and I, uh, in fact, I gave a, a floor speech Tuesday, uh, where I, or Monday, where I uh, indicated that I uh, have supported the uh, President's uh, surge uh, by sending 30,000 troops. Uh, that's actually encouraged uh, Afghanis to have faith uh, in their future, and now an additional 70,000 uh, Afghan uh, security forces. Um, Admiral Olson, on behalf of the Military Personnel Subcommittee, in your written testimony, you uh, discuss the establishment of a pressure on the force task force to survey and analyze the effects of repetitive combat deployment over ne nearly a decade. And I want to thank you for doing that. Uh, and particularly, though, I'm concerned that uh, there has been a uh, higher percentage of officers leaving uh, at the 8 to 10 year mark. Can you provide uh, detail of what this uh, task force will do? Uh, and in the coming months, would you share the results with the committee? Yes, sir. The, the pressure on the task force is designed to get at what the data doesn't really present. Uh, responses generally lag data, data lags reality. We're really trying to be predictive and preventive in our approach. And to do that, we've got to be able to trust commanders' intuition, teammates' sense of what's happening in the team room, families, children, uh, as they sense uh, sense our force. And, and so we're really on a, on a survey mission to understand the plethora of, of factors that do affect uh, the overall health of, of our force. I do expect that report in about 90 days, and I, I do, I, I would certainly be willing to share it. Thank you very much. And uh, General Mattis, uh, when we go, we go to encourage the troops, so we do fact-finding. Uh, on my last visit there, uh, prior to this, uh, I was so impressed by uh, the uh, different teams that uh, were uh, performing route clearance, how brave they were. And I'm really grateful to see uh, the advances in technology with the mine roller program. Uh, what is the level of uh, providing those so that we can face the improvised explosive devices? Sir, the mine rollers work in most of the terrain where they can be employed on roads uh, with the vehicles that carry uh, the mine roller, that can, can uh, use the mine roller. As you know, not all vehicles can because they're a very, very heavy piece of gear. Ultimately, uh, Mr. Wilson, what we're going to have to do is this country is going to have to find a way to prematurely detonate IEDs. Right now, attacking the network, we are either 
finding or the people are turning into us about 70 percent of the IEDs that we run into, but about 30 percent are still going off against us, and it's the primary, uh, primary casualty-inducing weapon the enemy has. So this is a significant effort that we have underway to try and look at just, not just mine rollers, but the entire scope of the problem, sir. Well, I, I want to thank you on behalf of my constituents, and I've had two sons serve in Iraq, and I want to thank you for your leadership and, and uh, truly protecting our troops. I, I yield the balance of my time. Thank you. My turn. Uh, Admiral Olson, as you uh, noted in your opening statement, this is your fourth and final appearance in this capacity before this committee in all likelihood. I want to thank you again for your years of service to the nation. I'd like to ask you for a moment to take the long view of, for the benefit of the committee and the record and outline for us some of the future challenges that you see facing the force. I know as we visited last week, I believe it was, or the week before, uh, I know you've put a great deal of thought into this issue. In your opinion, what does, uh, what does the future hold for SOF and what will the force look like? What challenges do you see and what should Congress be concerned with? Thank you, sir. I, I think the future requirements for Special Operations Command will be in smaller teams in, in more places at the invitation, at the request of host governments who believe that um, highly skilled teams with a relatively small footprint uh, are of great value in their regions. Uh, this does require a different kind of uh, training program for us. It requires a different kind of education program for us, depending very heavily on the services, but understanding that we have to tailor some of that uh, to our own requirements. It also requires a different kind of, uh, of career management. Uh, it's got to, as I said in my opening statement, recognize some of the non-traditional skill sets, uh, those that are not necessarily platform-oriented, but more knowledge and experience-oriented, as essential military skills and, and incentivize uh, people to gain and, uh, and, and move within paths that, uh, that reward them for, for having done that. Um, I think that the force mix uh, will remain relatively uh, unchanged in terms of the balance uh, across our force. Um, I believe that our platform requirements as we have them programmed are relatively uh, sufficient for our uh, future needs. Uh, we will continue to require the ability to move um, in a way that's quite, uh, th that's quite traditional, quite, uh, quite obvious in our movements, and we also need to, re to be able to retain uh, the capability to move in a clandestine uh, manner when that's necessary, and I think the Special Operations Forces are inarguably the, the force of choice for any kind of uh, clandestine activity where that might be required in the future. Thank you very much. Uh, General Mattis, um, the LA Times reported that the president of Yemen, Ali, Ali, Ali Saleh, has agreed to a plan from opposition leaders that includes a demand that he step down by the end of the year. Can you com comment at all on the accuracy of this report? I cannot right now, sir. I've seen the, uh, the newspaper article but I, I've not seen anything more than that, so I'd prefer to learn a little more before I comment, sir. We all need to learn that skill. Uh, thank you very much, both of you, for your service and all of those sitting behind you there that, uh, that work with you every day. Uh, I, I want to talk to them and, and see how they, uh, they have special training for poker faces. Uh, I, I, I think they, uh, I've, I've watched, they don't give a thing away, and uh, it, that's a great, a great skill. Thank you all for your service. Appreciate it uh, very much, and this hearing now stands adjourned.
shot is up and will not go. Wow. Joey Taylor thought he had that one in. McDonald almost got into a mess. Three bounces all around, but not down. Livingstone bringing it back up the floor. Braxton Byers from last this past season took 216 <laughs> three-point shots, okay? So what's that tell you when he's getting the ball? What's he going to do? Putting it up. <laughs> he's putting it up. But he hit a good number of those that he put up. He certainly did. Shot Strong over 38%. rebound by Ford Bay. Puts it back up another one, and he and McDonald are talking to each other. They didn't say much, but they're looking at each other. More changes for Union. Greg Redford will check in, as will Brandon Smith, and also number four, Jeffrey Wright. There was a while they had, what, four Brandons on Union at one time a couple of years ago? Yeah. <laughs> Just say Brandon's Brandon. got it. You had a good chance. And you had a good team, too. <laughs> That's right. You had a good Brandon team. The all Brandon team. Trying to reset the 